next video. Good luck. So the topic for this video is truly fantastic, and it's truly very deep. We are going to discuss Russell's paradox and how it is a massive problem for naive set theory. And then even better, this horrific paradox that seems unsolvable and makes you want to despair about foundations of maths. It actually has a way around it. It has a solution. And that solution is axiomatic set theory. That solution is the mellow Frankel set theory. And that then is going to be the topic for this video. So if you watch this video to the end, you will understand how to get around the problem of Russell's paradox. So let's start by stating prerequisite knowledge. So basic knowledge of naive set theory is a prerequisite. Now, if you're sitting there in alarm thinking, oh gosh, what's that? Don't worry. Anyone who has clicked on this video and is interested in learning the mellow Frankel set theory almost certainly will have basic knowledge of naive set theory. So naive set theory is all of the set theory you know already before learning axiomatic set theory. So this definition here is actually Cantor's original definition of what a set is. So it's a well-defined collection of distinct objects. And hopefully that's your intuitive understanding of what a set is as well. Other things that you should know from naive set theory, you should understand what it means to union two sets together, what it means to intersect two sets together, and what it means to take the relative complement of B within A, uh, where of course this means take all the elements in A and subtract out the elements that are also in B. I also have a preceding video to this one in my playlist on set theory, which is about the proof that the cardinality of the power set of a set is never equal to the cardinality of the original set. And I would like you also to understand that prior to watching this video. So if you know that already, you don't need to watch that preceding video. We know that, of course. If you don't know that and would like to see that diagonal proof, uh, then please watch that video before proceeding to this one. So when naive set theory first came about, everyone was very excited. It looked fantastic. It looked as though we were going to be able to use this as the foundations for all of maths. All of the formal systems that we want to define in maths, they could be fundamentally thought of as sets. So for instance, all of group theory and then all of abstract algebra comes from sets. When we define groups, we start off with, let's start with a set of symbols and then we'll define the composition law on top of that. And then all of our classical algebraic number systems, which I have put here, so the natural numbers, the rational numbers, the real numbers, and the complex numbers, all of those could fundamentally be thought of as sets with then these additional algebraic composition laws defined on them. Other things like order, metrics, which we use for analysis, all of that could also be thought of fundamentally as you start off with the set and then you define these additional properties on top of it. So it seems extremely exciting that we could use this as the foundations of maths. And indeed, we can still use it as the foundations for maths, but there was a massive spanner thrown in the works when Russell came along and showed that there was potentially a massive inconsistency in set theory. So before Russell's paradox in naive set theory, there was an unwritten axiom or an unwritten assumption, and it's only been given a name in hindsight now that we realize how bad this assumption that they were making was. It's now called the axiom of unrestricted comprehension. And what this means is that people believe in naive set theory times, that you could define a set using any rule that you like. So for instance, you could make the set of all things that were red, that was a credible set. You could make the set of all things that have the letter I in them, that was a set. So you could make these sets according to whatever rule you wanted. You could define a set with whatever rule you wanted. That's why it's called unrestricted comprehension. So the defining of sets had no restriction in rules that you could make that they needed to obey, or the elements inside them needed to obey. This leads to Russell's paradox, which was uh, concocted by Russell. And this is the innocent looking set that breaks this axiom, or makes this axiom totally inconsistent. So R, the Russell set, and it's defined to be equal to the set of elements, X, where X does not contain itself. So the elements of this set are going to be sets themselves. So just to explain this a little bit better, let's take a concrete example. So here we have the set S, which is the set containing two elements, one and two. And you can see that neither of these two elements are equal to the set itself. So this is an example of a set that does not contain itself. So congratulations to the set S. It would meet the criteria to be a member. Can you up the volume? Um... Did I get the volume thing? Sound fixer. Oh, we can. Oh, thank God. Russell set R. Meanwhile, poor old set S X, where X does not contain itself. So the elements of this set are going to be sets themselves. So just to explain this a little bit better, let's take a concrete example. So here we have the set S, which is the set containing two elements, one and two. And you can see that neither of these two elements are equal to the set itself. So this is an example of a set that does not contain itself. So congratulations to the set S. It would meet the criteria to be a member of Russell set R. Meanwhile, poor old set S prime here is the set containing one, two. And then you can see I've put in S prime itself inside the set. So S prime is an example of a set that does contain itself. And it would not meet this criteria for admission into Russell set. So Russell set, therefore, is the set of all sets that do not contain themselves. Now, why is this a problem? Well, you can then ask the question, is R inside this set itself? Does this set contain itself? And the problem with that is there can be no correct answer. Because if the answer is yes, if R is inside itself, then it shouldn't be inside itself because it doesn't meet the criteria to be inside itself, which is not containing itself. If it were to be inside itself, it um, does contain itself, and therefore it doesn't meet this criteria. On the other hand, if R is not inside itself, then it doesn't contain itself, and it should be inside itself. So it can neither be inside itself nor outside of itself, and that's an inconsistency. So you might think this is just silly. Why would I ever want to define a set like that? However, if you work with this unwritten axiom that people were assuming in times of naive set theory that you could define a set according to whatever rule you like, then this is a perfectly credible rule. But the Wait, was it called naive set theory initially? Why would you follow something called naive? How stupid are you? I thought math majors were supposed to be smart. What a dumb fuck. Why would you ever follow any theory? It's called naive theory. What an idiot. Just wait for the next one. Wait for the updated version. Dumb fuck. Finding a set like that leads to severe logical inconsistencies where this set R can neither be inside the set nor can it not be inside the set. And here is why this is such a big problem, why this threatened everything. 
because how do you know in maths, if you're basing all of maths on set theory, how do you know that when you, for instance, define a set like this one, so the set of all elements x such that x is an element of the complex numbers and x satisfies this equation, how do you know when you define that set according to these rules, you've made a rule here, using this axiom you can use that rule to define this set, how do you know though when you define that set that you want to use in maths that it isn't subject to the same logical problems as this set? How do you know that there aren't things that can neither be inside the set nor can they be outside of this set? How do you know that all of this maths that is based on set theory isn't going to have the same inconsistencies as Russell's set up here? So that, ladies and gentlemen, that is the problem for this entire video. That is the motivation for all of axiomatic set theory, trying to get rid of this problem of Russell's paradox, trying to make set theory consistent once again. So how do you resolve this then? Well, some people might find this a little bit unsatisfying. The way you resolve this set is that you say it's not a set, you banish it from set theory. You also banish this axiom that allows this set to be a set from set theory. So you want to define set theory freshly, and that's what zimmer frankel set theory is going to be. And in this fresh definition of set theory, you want it the case that one, this is not an axiom, and two, this is not allowed to be a set in your fresh definition of set theory. So one way that you could imagine doing this is you could start from the top and work downwards. You could imagine trying to write down a list of all the things that are banned from being sets. And for instance, Russell set would be one of the things, or sets of that nature would be in this list of things that are banned from being sets. But that's very, very difficult because how do you know how many different sets there are that potentially lead to logical inconsistencies? We've got this example, but what if there are other ones out there? So it's a very difficult task to do that. And you never know whether you're going to actually be finished until it creates a list of rules of things that are banished. You might just have to add more things onto that list as more people come up with paradoxes forevermore. So instead what we do is we start at the bottom and we work up. So we start from the very basics and say what we're going to allow to be a set and then we build other things that are allowed to be set out of those things that we've started with and i'll show you how we're going to do that and that is all of what semello frankel set theory is about and the axioms of semello set theory are what are needed to be able to build more complicated sets that we want to be allowed i.e the sets for instance that are shown over here now we're not going to discuss all of the axioms of semello frankel set theory because some of the later ones are actually very complicated and they come from you needing these more complicated number systems to be allowed to be sets within set theory we'll do those in later videos in the playlist we'll just start off with the basics the main point of this video is to communicate the whole motivation uh, the whole ethos for semello frankel set theory which is to try and get around russell's set being allowed as a set by building from very basics what we're going to allow to be sets so in this video uh, we'll look for instance at the natural numbers and we'll look at the axioms that allow the natural numbers to be a set in this new freshly defined set theory so let's build the mello frankel set theory then. So before we begin, let me just say that we're not going to change the definition of a set or what it means to be the element of a set. When you are going deeper and deeper into maths, there is a limit to how deep you can go. At some point, you do have to stop, and many mathematicians choose this point to stop. They choose to assume that everyone intuitively understands the definition of what a set is and what it means to be the element of a set, and they don't try to define those further. Because if you start going deeper and deeper and deeper, eventually your definitions just become circular because you're going so deep that actually to define something, you're using the thing that you're defining to define it. Um, so it loses any sort of purpose to go that deep. So we'll stop at that point. We will assume that everyone intuitively understands the basics of what a set is and what it means to be an element of that set. And now in our new freshly defined set theories, a mellow frankel set theory, we're going to define what sets are actually going to be allowed in this theory. So um, holy fuck, I just something. Like, why are we watching this? Um, because I ran into two people somewhat recently that have made statements where um, I think the Empress person made the statement that like, oh, like nobody uses set theory anymore. Like math is completely broken. And then that the last guy that I talked to made some strange statements about math as well. And then I had some, I guess like some super irritated math undergrad, I think, emailed me. And he says that like all of this shit is stupid, that um, there's basically, there's like a new set theory. Nobody uses naive set theory anymore. All of those criticisms are dated. That there's like a, a, a zermelo frankel choice set theory. I think ZFC is the one that I think that people invoke. Um, that's like the solution to all of this. And the idea that there are these huge underlying fundamental contradictions of math as shown by Russell's paradox, which is not true anymore. That we work, that like everybody works off of the ZFC, this like kind of like... Um, that this form of set theory that like for the most part like deals with all of the problems brought up by Russell's paradox is what I've heard. It's just, I don't know if like, I'm like, okay, so I'm, cause I'm trying to do more learning on stream. Okay. As fucking painful as it is to do this publicly. So the way that I learn things is the same way that I teach my kid about things. Okay. Like what'll happen is, is I'll watch something. Chances are I'm going to remember 10% or 20% of this video. But what happens is that every time it's brought up and I learn something else, like I'll be like, oh, well, I remember this from that. Or like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense because I kind of remember that. So the goal, I've never, ever, ever heard of, of Zermelo Frankel set theory or Z Z I don't remember. I don't remember if I ever learn anything about this. I don't, so I don't know anything about ZFC. So I figured we just learn it. And then it's like, okay, cool. And then we move from there um, rather than, um, yeah. So it's just like, boom, just look at, um, yeah. Okay. Axiom number zero, I've called it. This axiom is often just omitted, so you often won't even see it. But I like to start with it because it is a very simple one and it gives you the starting point for which sets are going to be allowed. Uh, so this axiom, if it is defined uh, in your textbook, will be called the empty set axiom. So here's the symbol for the empty set phi, and it just means the set that contains nothing. And the empty set axiom is basically that this set is allowed in our new theory. It's going to be accepted as being a set. So there we have at least one thing in our new theory that's going to be allowed as a set. 
axiom number one then, the next one. This is called the axiom of extensionality, and this one you will always see, no matter which textbook you go to, you'll always see this usually as axiom number one. And this is a really big, horrible name for something that is incredibly simple. And it says that if two sets that are allowed in our new theory, so let's presume A and B are sets that are going to be allowed in this new theory, if they're the same, it simply means that all the elements within them are the same. So this is true if, for all x is an element of A, x is an element of B, and for all x is an element of B, x is an element of A. That's all it says. Two sets are the same if the elements are identical to one another. I don't know why it's called the axiom of extensionality. It's not what I would have called it. I think it means that it's about the extension of the sets, the elements within the set. Um, but I would have called it something like the axiom of identity rather than the axiom of extensionality. However, that is its name. So not a particularly deep axiom. However, nevertheless, very important thing that we are taking as true about sets. So it is an important thing to have formally written within our axioms. The next axiom, then, is what we'll call the power set axiom. And this says that if you have a set A that is allowed within our theory, then the power set of that set A is also allowed within the theory. So it's OK, you'll let that be a set as well. And this is actually why I wanted you to know the result from the preceding video in my playlist on set theory. So that preceding video, remember, was on the cardinality of the power sets and how it's never equal to the cardinality of the original set, even if that original set is the empty set. Because that then gives you the logical basis for understanding that the power set is never going to equal the original set itself. So this axiom, therefore, allows you to always create a new set that is allowed within the theory from an original set that is allowed within the theory. Now, the only set at the moment that's allowed within our theory is the empty set. So what we can do then to create new sets is successively take power sets. So we consider the power set of the empty set. Well, there's only one subset of the empty set, and that is the empty set. So the power set of the empty set is just going to be the set containing the empty set. You could also write it like this. Uh, so here we have a new set that is allowed to be a set within our theory, just from these two axioms that we've already got. Then we consider taking the power set of this new set that we've got, and we get this. So this now has two subsets. It has a set that contains nothing, so the empty set is a subset, and then it has a set that contains this element, which is the empty set. So it has a set containing the empty set. So the power set of this set is then this set, which contains now two elements. So you can see one from a set that contains zero elements to a set that contains one element to a set that now contains two elements, and you could go on like this. You've now got a huge number, an infinite number in fact, of sets just from these axioms that are actually going to be allowed to be sets within our new theory. Axiom number you three is called the pairing that. axiom. And this says that if you have two sets, A and B, that are allowed within the theory to be sets, then you can create a third set out of the two by taking the set that contains the set A and the set B, and that new set is going to be allowed to be a set within our new theory. Now, why is this useful? Well, it's useful in loads of ways, but continuing on our line of thought, we're heading towards what's called the Zamello construction of the natural numbers. So if we, for instance, take one of the sets that we've managed to construct thus far, so let's take this set here, the set containing the empty set, what we can consider doing is letting both A and B equal this same set. Then by this axiom, the set containing this and this is a new set. Now, by the axiom of extensionality, these two are the same element, so this is equal to this set that just contains the set containing the empty set, because by the axiom of extensionality, these two are equal to one another because they have the same elements. So we've now managed to get this thing here, uh, where we've got three set brackets, if you like, whereas this one had two set brackets, and obviously the empty set originally had one set bracket. And then we could go further, we could imagine trying to get this inside a further set bracket. Uh, and the way we can do that is just by making A equal this and B equal this again, and then by pairing axiom, the set containing those two is a set. But of course, because it's the same element, we can just reduce it down, and that then proves that this thing with four set brackets or three set brackets in the empty set inside is then also a set. And you can go on like this, you can put as many set brackets around as you like here, and they're all going to be allowed to be sets now in our new theory of set theory. And this is actually what's called the Zamello construction of the natural numbers, or this is where we're heading towards. We need a few more axioms to get there, the union axiom and the axiom of infinity. But what we can imagine doing is creating new symbols for these structures that we've created. So we'll call the empty set zero, sim uh, sorry, the symbol zero. We'll call the set containing the empty set the symbol one. We'll call the set containing the set containing the empty set two. We'll call this one then three. So you'll use these symbols in the way that you've always been brought up to use them. Um, so when you've got uh, n set brackets around the empty set, that will be identified with the nth natural number. And this is indeed how we're going to construct the natural numbers. There are multiple ways of constructing the natural numbers. Uh, this one is what's called the Zanello construction of the natural numbers. There is also the von Neumann um, construction of the natural numbers, which is often preferred because it's more obvious the ordering properties on that one. But this one is actually simpler in terms of set theoretic construction, so we'll stick to this one for now. Next axiom then. So axiom number four is called the union axiom. And again, this is very simple. It says that if you have two sets A and B that are allowed within your theory, then you can get a third set that is allowed as a set within your theory by unioning the two together. So A union B is also going to be a set. Now, how does this allow us towards what we're trying to do, which is show that the natural numbers, for instance, is a set that's going to be allowed within our theory? Well, we've already said that uh, we're going to use these symbols, the symbols that we recognize from the natural numbers, to denote these sets that we've managed to construct and show are allowed within our theory. What I want to now point out to you is that actually, if you look at what one is equal to, it's actually equal to the set containing zero, because zero is the empty set. And then if you look at what two is equal to, it's actually equal to the set containing one, because this is one, and you can see that one's inside this. So it's the set containing one, three then is equal to the set containing two, and so on. Four is going to be the set containing three. So what we can now do is apply our union axiom. So we can union these two sets that are allowed together to get a new set that's going to be allowed. And then that new set we can union to this, etc. So we can union all four of these together to get this set, zero, one, two, three. So by unioning one, two, and three, and four together, we get the set with the first four natural numbers. And we can go on, of course, so we can construct sets from zero to n, and these are going to be allowed within our new set theory. Now, at present, we haven't defined any of the other properties on these sets yet, so they haven't got an ordering, and they haven't got a arithmetic defined on them. There's no addition yet defined on them. At the moment, we're just trying to construct them merely as sets. And the next axiom is going to allow us to say, actually, that the set of all the natural numbers is going to be allowed to be a set within uh, our new theory. So axiom number five is called the axiom of infinity, and this is the axiom that is going to allow the entire set of all natural numbers to be a set in our new theory. So uh, we will define for any x, we'll define x plus one to be the set containing x. And of course, that is exactly what we've already been doing when we were using zero for the empty set, one for the set containing the empty set, two for the set then containing one, three for the set containing two, etc. So we're just continuing this on. We're saying that the next one along is just going to be the set containing the one that you've already got. Uh, this is, if you like, a recursive definition. 
And then the axiom of infinity is that the set containing all of these is allowed to be a set. So there exists a set that we might as well call the natural numbers because that's what it fundamentally is isomorphic to, uh, such that firstly, zero is going to be an element of n, so the first element, the empty set, has to be in there. Indeed, if you don't insist on that, then the whole thing doesn't even start off. So you have to insist that the first element is there, which is the empty set, or what we're calling now zero. Um, and for all elements inside here, the next one along also has to be inside there. So once zero is inside there, then the set containing zero has to be inside there. So one has to be inside there. And then once one is inside there, then the set containing one has to be inside there, which is two. So two has to be in there, and so on. Three has to be in there, four has to be in there. In fact, all of them has to be in there. And this axiom is saying that that set that contains all of them exists and is allowed to be a set inside the zanello frenkel set theory. And what we have just done, this construction of the set of natural numbers, this is called, as I previously said, the Zanello construction. And there are other constructions. They all end up exactly isomorphic to one another. Uh, I like this construction because it's very simple. The von Neumann, uh, or Neumann, I don't know how you pronounce it, construction uh, is slightly more complex initially when you look at it, uh, but has advantages in terms of defining order on the elements. And in fact, I think I'll make a video later on in the playlist in set theory on the natural numbers where we'll look at the construction of the arithmetic and the construction of the order on the natural numbers. And in that video, we'll be using von Neumann uh, construction rather than the Zanello construction because it's more helpful there. But as a first introduction, this one I think is easier to get your head around. So we're doing brilliantly. Just from these axioms that all sound perfectly reasonable, we've managed to arrive at a very important set that is going to give rise to a very important number system in maths. And nowhere, nowhere in the axioms that we study does it look as though something like Russell sets is ever going to be allowed to be a set within our theory. Now, the next axiom that we are going to put in is the. Um, wait, my food's going to be here soon. First introduction, this one I think is easier to get your head around. So, restricted comprehension, also called the axiom of subsets, and this is going to allow much more. But as a first introduction, this one I think is easier to get your head around. So, we're doing brilliantly just from these axioms that all sound perfectly reasonable. We've managed to arrive at a very important set that is going to give rise to a very important number system in maps. And nowhere, nowhere in the axioms that we study does it look as though something like Russell sets is ever going to be allowed to be a set within our theory. Now, the next axiom that we are going to put in is the corrected version of the axiom of unrestricted comprehension. It's going to be the axiom of restricted comprehension, also called the axiom of subsets. And this is going to allow much more maneuverability in our theory of sets. So previously, when we had the axiom of unrestricted comprehension, we were allowed to define all sorts of sets, loads of different sets. Now, the theory that we define so far, the axiom that we define so far, is very rigid. You know, the a number of things that we're actually able to do here is very restricted. The number of things we're allowed to call sets is very restricted. So we're going to put in an axiom that's going to allow us to use much broader ranges of rules to define new sets. However, it's going to have one crucial adaptation from the axiom of unrestricted um, comprehension that is going to fix the whole problem of Russell's paradox. So this is brilliant. This is, if you like, the actual solution to Russell's paradox. So I've written it down here. The axiom of restricted comprehension, also called the axiom of subsets, and there are a number of other names for it as well. This says that if A is a set allowed within our theory, then you can construct a subset from it using any rule you like to choose the elements from the original set that are going to go into the subset, and that new subset is going to be allowed within our theory to be a set. Contrast this to the axiom of unrestricted comprehension, which said that you can use any rule you like to define a set. In this new axiom of restricted comprehension, you can use any rule you like to define a subset, not a set. That's the crucial difference. I highly doubt Destiny's learning every word. I guess he's just, I'm just like trying to get the concepts is all I'm looking for. So it's, I, don't, I don't remember any fucking anything. I don't even know if I ever fucking studied set theory. It sounds to me like the problem was for a lot of naive set theory, there was some, there was like an unsaid rule of, of unrestricted comprehension where you could say, oh, well, we could basically have any set for anything because we didn't have like strict rules for constructing sets. And then from there came Russell's paradox, um, which is like a set can contain itself and not itself or something. Like some paradox are basically destroyed um, are kind of the, the, because of that like unsaid or unstated axiom that I guess was later like retroactively discovered. So I guess like Zermelo, um, I guess was like, oh, well, okay, well, since clearly this doesn't work, we need another way to construct sets. So here are, so far we've got six axioms for ways to construct sets. Now we've gotten at least like the natural numbers out of sets. And because we've like been more rigid in our definition of strict like axioms, we don't have to worry about Russell's paradox because that wouldn't be allowed to be, um, that set can't be created under these axioms given for the construction of these sets. I don't know, that's what it sounds like. Hold on, I'll be back, one second. I'm, I don't, I'm not a math major, okay? Let me get my food, one sec.
<sighs> okay. Thoughts on the Atlanta shootings? I don't know. I haven't heard or read anything about him. No clue. Summary is okay. CF axioms have never been trying to be inconsistent, and we have been trying to break them for the last century. We know that if the axioms are consistent, they cannot prove their own consistency, but we have lots of results because it's a good feeling. Inconsistent. Okay, cool. Find a subset, not a set. That's the crucial difference. That's the solution to all of this. So let's examine this in detail. So let's start just with some trivial examples. So if we consider our set of natural numbers that was just agreed as a set thanks to the axiom of infinity. My understanding is also that like 99.9% .9 of math that's ever done in like any work is going to be based off of this zermelo frankel set theory as well. That, that's my understanding. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's my understanding of that as well. We're doing this so that the next time somebody says, um, the next time somebody says math is inconsistent or set theory isn't real or whatever, um, then I have a better response because some guy emailed me last night. He was like super fucking ass mad <laughs> that, that I, I don't know why you guys can't just write emails in non-toxic ways. Jesus Christ. You gnome fuck! Peppo Comfy. What? Okay, apparently I can't fucking find this email at all now, so. <sighs> oh, here it is. Nope, never mind. Wait, why can't I find this stupid fucking email? In trash? Did I delete it? Oh, here it is. The title of this email is Your Ignorance Regarding Mathematics. No, I'm not. This guy posted on like three different accounts, I think, in my chat, but no, I'm not our Lord and Savior Kogasa. Just a pure math undergrad little shit. Now, red flag, undergrad, means you're a high school graduate. That's what you should... New rules! You're not allowed to introduce yourself in the real world as an undergrad. Don't say it. What you actually are is a high school graduate. That's what you are. There are no such things as undergrads. There are people that have their four-year degrees, and there are people that finish high school, okay? There is no in-between. This post will be written to hopefully make Stephen more aware regarding his ignorance of mathematics and how it allows his opponents to make utterly ignorant claims and get away with them. Before we start talking about Empress, that Prime K's podcast person, and Pizza Guy, we must first begin with an actual background of how mathematics works. To begin with, how do you rigorously construct a mathematical theory? You begin with an idea, so-called notions, of what you wish to describe, and then try to rigorously give this thing, this mathematical theory, a rigorous description. Indeed, we require both axioms and primitive notions. An axiom, you likely already know what is... And primitive notions are uh, that which can, we cannot define by previously defined terms, infinite regress. Indeed, in Euclidean geometry, think high school geometry, when using Hilbert's axioms, we do not actually define what a line or a point is. We merely use our axioms to ascribe to them our primitive notions, certain properties, restrictions of what they can be or what they can do. For example, an axiom we might have is the following. For every two points, there exists a line that contains them both, but we do not actually go about defining what a point or a line is. Once we have our primitive notions and axioms, we would hopefully start being able to prove interesting results within this mathematical theory. Now, is, are, is there a grand theory within which math is done? The answer is yes. It is known as ZFC set theory for short, or Zamello-Frankel plus choice set theory, if you want the long version. Mind you, if you are actually 
if you are an actually if you are actually a set theorist or logist logician jesus you may actually work outside zfc and perhaps use different axioms for set theory uh, but this is already within the domain of meta mathematics and simply not relevant to what virtually every mathematician that is not a set theorist or logician which is the vast majority do in other words essentially all non meta mathematics is done within zfc so what is ZFC? It is a set of axiomatic set theory that arose during the early 20th century, specifically due to apparent paradoxes like Russell's paradox. There are a myriad of other systems of axiomatic set theory like NBG or just ZF without the axiom of choice, but this one's pretty strong in allowing us to describe and potentially prove almost everything you would ever want to prove. We can now finally start talking about Empress's, um, ex-Empress's dumb fuckery. She said, starting at 121.35 here, the system set theory itself has contradictions and paradoxes, and then goes on to claim that Russell's paradox is an example of a contradiction in set theory. But as seen above, there are many different systems used to describe set theory, and not all of them suffer from Russell's paradox. Indeed, ZF was created out of Russell's paradox, pointing out the contradictions and naive set theory, but ZF does not suffer from Russell's, Russell's paradox, so... Empress's statement is completely wrong. However, Destiny was a disappointment in this debate since he allowed himself to be dunked on like the cuckold he is. Thank you. Um. Chat listen up closely because the properties of set theory could also apply to discussions of categories. People like Dimon Mama don't know how categories work and make dumb gender claims. Don't be like Dimon Mama who is also a frog poster. Nice. We never lose. Finally, we can talk about Pizza Guy being stupid beyond belief. Here, he started giving an anecdote regarding a friend of his who supposedly showed his math professor an equation that supposedly disproved mathematics. Lots of quotes were used there. The math professor in question was likely a dumb fuck physicist or even worse, an engineer. The idea that an equation would disprove mathematics is so utterly absurd that the statement itself does not even fall within the domain of being right or wrong. It falls within the domain of being a lefty. Pizza Guy's use of the word flaw makes it difficult to understand what the fuck he meant by flaw, but assuming he meant something like an inconsistent paradox, contradiction, or something thereof, he is nevertheless utterly wrong. Indeed, something like piano, piano, arithmetic, uh, basically a theory of arithmetic that almost all mathematicians implicitly use, does suffer from flaws insofar as it is not complete via Gödel's incompleteness theorem, an actual valid application, unlike that of Jordan Peterson's, and is provably consistent just not within um, piano arithmetic itself. I'm assuming this is piano is how you pronounce this. In this sense, mathematics does have its flaws, but likely not in the way that the pizza guy believes it does. Furthermore, pizza guy also stated that the actual flaws happen far out in the system, so it won't cause problems with standard addition, multiplication, dot, 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 which is absurd by the above. The flaws can actually happen even if something is basic in something as basic as arithmetic, as these flaws concern the fundamental logic by which mathematics is built up. Ultimately, it is difficult to make sense of what pizza guy even means, but Stephen allowed himself to be dunked on nevertheless. Sorry for any grammar mistakes. I study pure math, not English. <laughs> but anyway, there you go. So now we're watching this video. Ten minutes left. Then we can consider trying to define a subset of that. So we could consider the set S, which is equal to all elements of that original set of natural numbers. And the rule that we'll make, that any rule that comes into our head that we'll use, is we want x to either equal 3 or x to equal 4. So only two elements satisfy that rule, the elements 3 and the elements 4. So that set containing just 3 and 4, that's going to be allowed to be a set within our new uh, theory. Of course, we could have got that long ago, because uh, just from the union axiom, we could have unions the set containing 3 and the set containing 4 uh, together, uh, and thought that that was a set. So we haven't gained anything new. Uh, we already knew this was a set. Uh, but that's an example of applying this um, axiom and obtaining a subset that is allowed to be a set. And we could do it again. So we could consider now S prime which is going to be a subset of this set, S, so it's going to be the elements of X uh, within S, such that they obey this rule, and the rule this time is some nonsense that I came up with, that the element has to be red. And of course, neither of these elements are red, they're white here, so none of them obey that, so there's going to be no elements in this subset, so it's going to be equal to the empty set, of course we know the empty set is already an allowed set within our theory, so it certainly hasn't broken any of the former axioms yet. So let's now try a more difficult example. Let's think of that rule that under the axiom of unrestricted comprehension gave rise to the horrific problem, and let's now apply it here. So let's consider again the set R, Russell's set, but this time it has to be a subset, so we'll use our big set of natural numbers. So uh, elements from the natural numbers, and now they have to obey this rule that they are not contained within themselves. Well, if you remember the way each of those natural numbers were defined, they were sets, but they were sets containing the natural number prior to them. So for instance, four contained was a set containing three, 10 was a set containing nine. So each of them, although it contains lots of nested sets inside it, it doesn't actually contain itself. So it's not the set containing X, it's the set containing X minus one. So it doesn't contain itself. So in fact, all of the elements of the natural numbers obey this criterion, and therefore we would get the whole set back again. So now we can ask the question, is R going to be inside itself? Well, the answer is no, because R is not inside the natural numbers. So quite clearly, the answer is no, because this has to be a subset of the natural numbers. Now consider that we were taking a subset of a set that did contain R. What would happen then? So if we had the natural numbers union this set containing R, and we were taking instead the subset of this, so imagine now instead of N, we've got N union R here we'd actually be faced then with the same problem, because R could neither be inside itself nor outside itself, because if it was inside itself, then it shouldn't be inside itself, because it contains itself, but if it's outside of itself, then it should be inside of itself, because it doesn't contain itself. So 
we're saved by the fact that R cannot be inside of here because this had to be a set that was already defined within our other axioms, and our other axioms would never have allowed R to be defined, so it's not going to be inside here. That's what saves this, the fact that R isn't able to be defined yet by the other axioms. So this is nonsense, it hasn't been allowed within the theory yet. So we're saved by the fact that you're only allowed to use whatever rule you want to create a subset of a set that's already allowed within our theory. You're not allowed to just define a set using whatever rule you want. And that's how we change the law of unrestricted comprehension into the law of restricted comprehension, and that saves the theory from this inconsistency from Russell's paradox. Miles still allowing us a lot of freedom to use whatever rule we want to define subsets. So we're about to end the video. Before I end the video, I would just like to say something about the axiom of choice. So this is actually axiom number 10 in zamello frankel set theory. We have skipped out axioms 7, 8, and 9. They are complicated, and they come from you needing more and more complicated sets to be allowed in mathematics. So as you're trying to build more and more complicated number systems, uh, additional axioms are needed, and those are axioms 7, 8, and 9. Uh, we're not going to discuss those in this video. I'll make, I'm hoping to make more videos in this place on set theory, and we'll go into those axioms later with the proper motivation for them. The axiom of choice is axiom number 10, and it's actually the most controversial of all the axioms. In fact, some people refuse to accept it. So there are two strains of zamello frankel set theory. ZF set theory, just standing for zamello frankel set theory, means the first nine axioms of set theory, whereas ZFC means zamello frankel plus the axiom of choice, so with axiom number 10 allowed, the axiom of choice. And the reason I wanted to bring the axiom of choice up at this point is really just to compare and contrast it to the axiom of subsets that we just talked about. So the axiom of subsets allows you to pick out a single element from a set and put it in a set by itself. So if we take an example, so here's a set, the set containing 1, 2, and the set containing 1, 2 also is an element inside our set. Um, so we could consider a subset, S prime, that we're going to have containing only one element that we picked out of this set, and it would be defined like so. The element is from the original set, S, and it obeys this rule that x is equal to 2. So we've got a specific rule for picking out an element, we pick out that element 2, the only element that obeys that rule, uh, and then put it in a set, and that's our, our subset containing a single element. And the subset axiom tells us that we can do that, and that this thing we get will be a set itself. The axiom of choice tells you something very similar but with a crucial difference. It tells you that whatever set you have, you are able to pick out an element from that as a representative of that set without any rule needed whatsoever. That's the axiom of choice. I'll say that again, that whatever set you have, it is always possible to pick out an element from that set, and it could be any of those elements. You're just looking for a representative, so you can pick randomly a representative and use that as the representative for the set, and you don't need any rule for picking out that element. That is the axiom of choice. It's possible to get a representative without a rule for selection. In contrast, the axiom of subsets, it can pick out a single element from a set as well, but it requires a rule in order to pick that element out. So I've written that down here. So the axiom of choice is that it's always possible to select an element out of a non-empty set, even without a rule for selection. And the point that I didn't say earlier is that clearly the set needs to be non-empty for this to apply. If the set has no elements, then it's not going to be possible to pick an element out of it. However, if you have a non-empty set, the axiom of choice is that it is always possible to pick an element out of that set as a representative, even if I don't give you a rule for how to actually pick that element. And that's not something that the axiom of subsets allows you to do. It can do it if you have a rule for selection. But the hypothesis, the axiom uh, that allows you to do it without a rule is called the axiom of choice. And it is controversial. Some people think this is nonsense. How can you actually select an element without a rule? Uh, and it does lead to certain problems in that certain very famous paradoxes arise from this, which is why some people don't accept it. We're not going to go into that here, it's very, very complex. Um, but the main point that I raised this for is just to highlight how this is different to the axiom of subsets. So thank you for watching and I hope that you feel that you gained something.